Welcome to Prosecco and Pros, episode 19. This week's Prosecco is Menage a Trois. This week's prose is the short story, The Water That Falls on You From Nowhere, by John Chu. Thank you for joining us for an episode of Prosecco and Pros. I'm Amy. And I'm Wendy. This is a deep dive virtual book club hosted by two English teacher army wives who love to read and love the bubbly. In each episode, we will pair a bit of bubbly with a discussion of a novel or a succinct short story. I do love a short story. So let's pop, pop a cork, cork for this week's episode of Prosecco and Prose. For those of you who are listening in the car, please don't drink and drive. Save the bubbly for later. Episode 19. Girl, season two is winding down. It is. Only one episode left. Kind of hard to believe. We've been getting some great reading requests for season three. Really have. And there's still time to get yours in if there's something you're wanting us to discuss. Final decisions are fast approaching, so let us know soon. I'm really enjoying being pushed out of my reading comfort zone. Oh, and my personal prose challenge is also off to a great start. That's awesome and such a fun idea. Did you just come up with it based on your reading habits? Was it something you saw or a combo of both? Saw various challenges at the beginning of the year on Insta and Facebook. None appealed to me. Some challenges had to do with the number of books one reads throughout the year. Do you realize that some people read a book every other day? Mm. I'd never get anything accomplished. I read a book five and six times before it sees the shelf again. I would say reading one book a day is quite an accomplishment, but even the books we don't use for the podcast? Well, no, of course not. The ones for the podcast are my <laughs> OCD books that are read and reread and read again and again and again. Now, my challenge list that required some deep research. Gonna check off one with our next novel, you know the- Don't tell them. Oh. Wait until the end of the episode. Why? Afraid that they won't stick around to listen? Maybe. You know, not everyone likes short stories like we do. True, true. But they love us. Well, they love some of the foolishness that comes out of our mouths. But you know, I could read a book every other day. No, you could. Just wanting something unusual, you know, some different challenges on my list. If interested, our listeners can go to our Prosecco and Pros Instagram page and, you know, find my page link in our bio, aka underscore Horner, right, to check out my ultimate challenge. I would love to have anyone who wants to join in to please do so and would love to see what you're reading, your thoughts, whatever's on your mind. You did have a few unusual ones. I actually love that I made your challenge and that I get to pick a book for you this year. Hmm. Careful there, high speed. Although you haven't disappointed me yet. Such a great idea to bring in new reads. I'm terrible for getting stuck. Not that reading is stuck, but I find an author or genre I love and I read everything I can get my hands on by them. Quickly seeing this with my latest James Patterson novel, The Russian. It is so good. Takes me back to my investigator days. Patterson has another one I'm getting ready to buy also. It's called Walk in My Combat Boots, True Stories from America's Bravest Warriors. Nonfiction. He teamed up with, oh God, what's his name? Retired Ranger vet, first sergeant, one of the Black Hawk Down guys. Hmm. I love military stories. Cheers. Me too. Cheers. But I would just ask that, you know, you don't give me another thriller for a bit. I know that is your genre of choice. Loving them too now, but it's, you know, it's time for something different. Who knows? This challenge may help me find some new authors and genres to add to my ever-growing list. Wendy, you should join me in this challenge. Maybe I will. Maybe the next one. Oh, come on. There's still a lot of the year left for this one, but no pressure. So let's talk about our Prosecco. Menage a trois. Okay. Menage a trois is a DOC, 11% alcohol, is about a, around $11, dry, and our Vavino app rates it a 3.6. Hmm, not exactly a great rating. No. But a lot of threesomes in that menage a trois rating. You mm. know, you got your three, two times three is six. So let's see. Do we have to go there, Amy? Couldn't resist, but carry on. It's a very light, pale yellow color and lots of bubbles. Mm -hmm. But they're not in a steady stream from just a few points on the bottom. They are all over. 
Very sparkly this one looks. Definitely lots of bubbles, and they, you know, sort of linger at the top. I'd say the color looks, you know, light straw, sort of like Montana wheat. Ooh, nice visual. Very citrusy smell. Lemon. And crisp. Ah, fresh. The label says, let's see here. This fun-loving sparkler is a fabulously fresh and flirty. Ooh, I love the alliteration. Mm -hmm. Fabulously fresh and flirty with alluring floral aromas and crisp citrus flavors. Not really getting a floral, but if the smell is any indication, it'll be citrusy. Let me see. Hmm. Oh, yeah. There is definitely citrus there. And some honey. Not like the Lavostra, but just a touch of it. Stings the tongue. It's a little zappy. Mm. Now, I get your honey, honey. Mm -hmm. Not heavy at all, though. No. Got the citrus. Sort of like an orange. Or wait, let me, let me try again. Ah, marmalade. Hmm. Marmalade. Hmm. Okay, I, uh... Hmm. I get more of an apricot and something Ooh. else. Maybe like a not quite ripe peach, I'm thinking. Hmm. Now it really lingers in your mouth. There's just a bit of a bite to it. Again, just zappy. Hmm. I'm also getting your apricot now on the finish. So for me, it has a bit of a, like a sticky finish. You okay? <clears throat> I'm okay. Okay. The honey, <clears> hmm. <throat> you sure? I'm good. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <clears throat> the honey, it just kind of, it kind of, um, you know, makes me feel thirsty. I have to ask you, <clears throat> did you just say sticky finish? <coughs> yeah, I like the honey. It's sticky, right? Oh, that's so you'll come back for more. <laughs> anyway, this is my podcast co-host. She does not have... We are drinking menage a trois. We are, but I am trying to elevate... Your palate. Mm. And I definitely will come back for more. Let's move on because I finally have my voice back. Okay, good. <clears throat> so then I would like to ask you any thoughts on food pairings? Well, I'm not sure yet. Yeah, because you're stuck on honey, but go ahead. Oh, I might have worked up an appetite. You? <laughs> well, I feel I feel like an appetizer soup. You know, like like a chowder or a lobster bisque or, oh, yes, prosciutto melon fresh mozzarella skewers would be good. Oh, I love those. And you make the best ones. But I'm thinking of my baked pimento crabby bites. Mm. I'm so going to post that recipe. Divine. And you can make and freeze them ahead. A bit of salty with a sweetness. Oh, and also, it would work with that um, Asian salad that I love from Giant. Um, those pre-packaged ones from Dole or Taylor Farms. Those are my fave. Yum. And I like anything that you can make and freeze ahead of time. It all sounds very delicious. Mm -hmm. I will post those on our Instagram. That recipe is so good. Yeah, for sure. So their website, menageatroiswines.com, which is absolutely fabulous. You've got to check it out. It says it pairs well with a fresh fruit tart. Oh, okay. Whole Foods has the mm. best fruit tarts. Yes. And I get that. Also from the website, notice the blue dancers on the label? I do see that there are two, not three. So the mark of the twin dancers is inspired by the famous Rorschach inkblots. Really? Yes, really. From the website. The founders felt that using abstract dancers in motion, which you interpret in your own way, would communicate the thrilling taste experience and the alluring, playful personality that's blended into every sensual sip of menage a trois. I like their thinking. Everyone's experience with this Prosecco, with any Prosecco, really, will be unique. It will, just like everyone's experience with prose. Oh, wow. When you smell it now, it's got a bit of a peach smell. Do you get that? Oh. At the pop of the cork, this menage a trois was very citrusy. But, you know, as it's opened, I can smell a bit of the floral. I like your little turn of phrase. And I do get the floral aromas now. Adds to the sweetness of the in the taste for me. Mmm. 
I think a good salty baked pimento crabby bite or two or three would be mm. a perfect pairing for our bubbly. Next time, for sure. You know, the Menage a Trois website had a recipe for Prosecco gummies mm. and a raspberry limoncello Prosecco that looks amazing when it's finally summer again. Prosecco gummies. That sounds like a great party favor takeaway for our next in-person book club meeting. That would be a fun idea. You've got to check out their website. Tons of great recipes. And I only looked at the ones for Prosecco. Author bio? Definitely checking out that website, as if I need any more reason to drink Prosecco. I hope there's enough for me to have three glasses today. Stop. Okay. Snapping out of the spell. Hey guys, if you liked our menage a trois tasting, leave us a review on Apple Podcast. We are enjoying the most recent comments. Some great feedback. Now let's talk about John Chu. Our author was born in Taiwan and moved to the U.S. at age six. He is, get this, a microprocessor architect. I, I looked that up because I wanted to know what that meant he did. And? I, I'm pretty sure I don't really understand, but it is one of the most challenging and interesting jobs in the tech industry. Though, to be honest, that was from microprocessor designer since I couldn't find a microprocessor architect. So are you saying this might not even be correct? I guess I am, but it said, if I may continue. Of course, sorry. They spend their days solving logic problems that can be reduced to a series of symbols with a pen and paper. And if that's not true, microprocessor architects, just let me know what you do do. Gosh, I mean, we should have just asked Mr. Chu when we were messaging with him. He was so responsive and helpful. He is also, as this episode attests, a science fiction writer, a literary translator, and fun fact, he's also a podcast narrator. He even read this short story on an episode of Escape Pod, the original science fiction podcast. If you guys are interested in listening, it is Escape Pod 459, The Water That Falls on You From Nowhere. Amy, can you link it in the show notes? Of course, and you can also find it in the show notes from the previous episode, which would be 18. I always post the short stories ahead of time for our regulars who read ahead, or for anyone who just wants to read a great short story. I just love that we can say we have regulars. I know, right? Mr. Chu's work has been published in the Boston Review. Uncanny, Asimov Science Fiction. I just love saying Asimov. I know you do. Also in Clark's World and Tor.com, which is where we found today's short. This short won the 2014 Hugo Award for Best Short Story. Mr. Chu also translates novels and stories from Chinese to English. He certainly has a full plate. Mm -hmm. So glad he has time to write great shorts like this. Now, I read How to Piss Off a Failed Super Soldier too. That sounds funny. One of his characters is named H, A-I-T-C-H, and the other one is J. Get it? J. Mm -hmm. So good. But I would say that science fiction isn't a genre I normally gravitate to, but we've read some really good ones over the past year. Totally agree. Not exactly my kind of story usually either, but I have enjoyed dipping my toes in with some great short stories, this one included. So let's get right to it. Tell us about the characters. Well, we have two main characters. Both appear to be in their early 30s. Matt, our narrator, is, get this, a biotech engineer. Art imitating life? Mm. We know Matt is over 30 because it comes up about marriage and having children. That's right. And then there's Gus, his mixed martial artist, personal trainer, dead language reading and speaking boyfriend. His character reads like a total 10, if you're rating. Oh, yeah. I loved all things Gus. He seemed like a really interesting guy. Any guy into books is our kind of guy. It's like, you're my person. Gus, I hurt you. You're a little spicy today. I think it's this Prosecco. Always blaming the Prosecco. Let's get to our summary. I just wanted to start by saying that I absolutely loved the illustration for the story by Christopher Silas Neal. It was, again, on Tor.com. The white and blue jagged icy water on the black background was so chilling and so sinister. Like a bad omen or storm ready to hit. Exactly. Then you have this handsome man in red being pelted with said water. If you look closely, there is another man 
oh so shirtless, diving deep into the water. It tells me that something big is getting ready to go down in this reed. I have it right here. I did not look that close. You're so right. You know I can't help myself. But in my research, I found red is such a positive color in the Chinese culture. So I know a happy ending will more than likely take place for the man in the illustration. I just knew that this was going to be a good short read. And it took me about 40 minutes to get through it and about 50 minutes to listen to it on a skate pod. I did enjoy listening to the author read his story. Mm -hmm. A little preface from Tor.com. In the near future, water falls from the sky whenever someone lies, either a mist or a torrential flood, depending on the intensity of the lie. This phenomenon has been going on for only a few weeks. The water is not harmful, but oh, so freezing cold. However, if you tell something that is not a lie, but not exactly the truth, the air gets very humid. Now, a very, very true statement can actually remove the water. Yes, a very interesting phenomenon. Makes me think of the liar, liar, pants on fire saying, but less dangerous. Well, there is a threat of hypothermia with the water, but not the third degree burn. <laughs> True. <laughs> so Matt, our narrator, and Gus have been in a relationship for a while, but Matt has not come out to his traditional Chinese parents, though he does think, in the story, that he should have done it a decade ago. Gus's declaration of love to Matt and Matt's decidedly reserved response prompts Matt to invite Gus home with him for the Christmas holiday. Now, Due to the complexities of the Mandarin language, there aren't actual words for boyfriend or girlfriend. So Matt has been referring to Gus with his family as a word that means sweetheart, lover, or spouse. Not using names isn't unusual. Names are for friends and acquaintances. Right. And there has been a lot of pressure for Matt to find a good Chinese girl, get married, and start a family. So traditional and lots of pressure. Mm -hmm. But Matt brings Gus to Christmas and Matt's sister quickly picks up on the nature of their relationship. Girl is livid. <laughs> yep. She? Oh, she's, <laughs> she's hot. She accuses Matt of trying to kill their parents. I think she needed some water to cool her off mm, a little bit. She did. Not only the parents, embarrassing them in front of her in-laws, mm -hmm. remember, because they mm -hmm. came too. She reminds Matt his job, his job, is to give his parents a grandson. Make them happy. Yes, and she proceeds to spend the holiday keeping Matt and their parents apart, or at least not letting Matt be alone with them to prevent Matt from coming out. But, spoiler, it all comes to head at dinner when the in-laws ask the inevitable marriage question. It's the lead up to the grandson question. Of course. Matt decides he's not hiding any longer and tells the dinner table that Gus has proposed to him. Matt's sister explodes and kicks him out. But as Gus points out, when he comes to calm Matt down while packing, his parents already knew. Remember that? Mm-hmm. And in a real funny moment, mom's big concern is whether Matt and Gus <laughs> right. can give her a grandson using both of their genes. Brains and brawn. <laughs> It was funny. <laughs> Gus has won over the family. Maybe not the sister. Nah. But mom seems happy that Matt has someone who can look out for him. Gus and Matt do leave for a motel, though. And Matt tells Gus a story that helps explain the strained relationship between him and his sister. Gus leaves to give Matt, you know, some time to process. Mm -hmm. And in the empty room, Matt can finally say, I love you, Gus. I wasn't sure at first how I felt about the ending because... I wasn't sure how the story about Matt's sister fit exactly. It gives us such insight, but more importantly, it shows the reader that Matt is finally starting to open up. Okay. Shares why it's been, you know, so hard for him to do so. Mm -hmm. The ending is so incredibly hopeful, and I flippin' loved it. Totally agree. Let's get to our theme. Truth and lies. Now... Like in life, there are some qualifications to the lies. Huge deceit will get someone an icy torrent. White lies or less consequential lies might just get a mist. But there are also the lies we tell ourselves, which in this short don't seem to cause the water to fall. No, it doesn't. 
it seems they have to actually be spoken aloud to cause a disturbance in the atmosphere. But it had us thinking about why we lie to ourselves and to others. Right. The story opens with water falling on Gus. We don't know what lie he has told or if he's telling a stream of them. A new fad has arisen from this phenomenon, sort of like a, you know, to me it was like a frat boy experience, Mm -hmm. to be able to stay in the falling water as long as possible. Nothing is safe from becoming a fad, especially the more challenging it is to accomplish. Gus is up to a minute now. Hmm. This was interesting to me because I felt Gus was living the, you know, the more truthful life. Right. I kind of felt like he was, you know, rarely caught under a deluge of water. Same. Same. But Matt is a different story. He is very aware of what he can say or how he can say it to avoid getting wet. And he's hiding a lot from Gus, from his family, even from himself to some degree. He is, but he feels, and I think this would be a common argument, that he's doing it to protect his family. Totally agree. But often, the lies we tell others end up hurting ourselves more. Mm -hmm. And Matt does hurt Gus, which really, really hurts Matt. It becomes the breaking point of continuing to hold on to the lie. I think it definitely does. And also, he says the water falling meant he couldn't lie to his family anymore. So there's that. He's forced to let the truth set him free. You could say that. But Matt has gotten very good at skirting around his lie and not letting it be revealed. I mean, even over their holiday, the only person who gets wet is his sister. Good point. It's when he's around Gus that Matt has a harder time keeping his true feelings from being known. Right. He loves Gus, but does not want to or seem to be able to say it. And yet, when he doesn't, he's subjected to the icy water, even when it's just him and Gus. I didn't get why he would stubbornly hang on to the lie. It takes a lot to let go of something you've shaped, you know, your whole life around. Matt is so much more afraid of what he will lose because he can't yet see what he will gain. True. Maybe that's why some people lie. They think they are protecting others. Now, this story didn't have a huge deceit kind of lie. I think of those as pretty self-centered. A lie to protect yourself. No, it really didn't. I wonder what kind of waterworks those lies would bring. That seems like it would be the very worst kind of lie. So does a rain spout come and just completely wash the person away? You know, like a tsunami? (laughs) (laughs) Really, Amy? So that's actually very insightful. I I would have expected you to compare it to that car wash experience where you nearly left the sunroof open. What? The author said the falling water is based on the intensity of the lie. I think that's a very deductive statement. Yes, it is. But also a very funny visual. Let's get to our symbol of water. Yes, a pretty clear symbol. We will also talk about the rain because water that falls is usually, usually considered rain. And I thought it would be interesting to look at both in relation to the short. Ooh, interesting. So water is symbolic of cleansing, obviously, and life and freedom. In literature, it is also a symbol of power Mm -hmm. and, get this, has the ability to free characters as well as claim them. Getting water dumped on you after you lie is quite the visual of a cleansing. And I guess how bad your lie is, is relative to how much cleansing you need. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about the water giving the characters the ability to either free them or claim them, though. You know? Okay. The water falling freed Matt to non-verbally express his true feelings to Gus, but it also held him kind of hostage from revealing his truth to his family, especially his parents. Right. Moving to the rain aspect of it, though. Rain is usually in conjunction with a storm, Mm -hmm. which, you know, foreshadows something bad or unpleasant, you know, is going to occur. Well, you just got caught in a lie. Not the best event happening. Especially when it's so public. But rain also symbolizes being left out or alone. Fun and rebellious. Misery. Romantic. Like, I'm willing to stand in the rain for a kiss. Gus kind of did that in the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, the fad bit, right? Mm -hmm. When Matt was watching him and Matt, and just when Matt feels he can't take it anymore, Gus says, I love you, Matt. And the water is literally sucked out of the air. Quite a romantic declaration. So romantic. 
Rain, like the cleansing water, is also symbolic of renewal and rebirth, a good thing coming after a bad time, or the washing away of the old and regrowing of something better. After Matt skirts around admitting his own feelings, the water falls on him, and it causes him to invite Gus home for the Christmas holiday. It's a chance to regrow their relationship into something better. That's right. And when the sister gets rained on for saying Gus will probably cheat, maybe something good will come from that. Like actually wanting to see her brother truly happy. Really loved the symbol in this piece. Was just so perfectly fitting. Now, our names were also very, very fitting. They were. Tell us what you found for Matt. The name Matt is Hebrew meaning gift from God. I'm thinking maybe Matt is the gift to his family that'll provide a son to carry on the familial name. They definitely wanted him to do that. It was almost all they could talk about in his life. Even when it's clear Gus is his chosen one, all mom wants to know is if they can make a son with <laughs> both of their genes. Just like a little medical miracle. Mats are good at making money, point blank. Mm. They let their partners take on the dominant role in the relationship. A mat takes on challenges and is passionate, so their relationships are often intensely emotional. Okay, Matt does seem to be the breadwinner, and Gus does take the lead, but Matt didn't strike me as exactly passionate. Not yet, anyway. Maybe he's on his way after his water cleansing and family announcement. What about Gus? Gus is Latin for worthy of respect. Mm. Gus's are physically well-built men of considerable strength. That's our Greek god Gus. Exactly. But to contrast this macho image, the name Gus has associations with children. Remember how Matt's nieces took to Gus? I do. Anything else? A Gus is a very communicative man, great with large groups, happy playing with children, sincere in affections, and faithful to his partner. Ha! Well, take that, sis. That perfectly describes Gus. Not a name you see often. I love it. Gus was such a great character. He really was. He was the true embodiment of his name. Game time? Let's. I'm excited for this because we had such a fun time last time we played this. Two facts and a fib. Mm -hmm. Because the holiday of Christmas was celebrated in the story, we thought it might be fun to stump each other with some Christmas facts from America and China. And after 15,000 texts back and forth, we'll see if either of us were clear on the instructions and hope that we don't get soaked. Let's hope not. Maybe it'll rain for Seco, though. Ooh. But even if we were unclear, it'll be fun. I'll go first, and I'm going to start with Chinese Christmas traditions. Okay. okay. okay? One. In China, Christmas is not considered a public holiday, and people do not get the day off. Two, Chinese Santa plays a saxophone, and instead of elves, he is accompanied by several young women who are his nieces, dressed in red and white. Three, people give apples on Christmas Eve because in Chinese, the symbols for Christmas Eve mean peaceful or quiet evening, which has been translated from the carol, Silent Night. The word for apple in Mandarin sounds like the word peace. Maybe we still weren't clear, as I did mine a bit differently. I weaved our characters in for fun. I don't think it matters as long as it's fun. And that never seems to be in short supply. No guess. Okay, okay. These all seem like they could be true. Nothing, you know, overly outlandish. So I'm looking for the fib, right? Right, and no water fell to give you a hint. No, unfortunately. I'm thinking that Chinese Santa is not a big saxophone player and that Chinese Christmas isn't that big of a holiday given the Chinese New Year, so I'm going to go with number two. Well, actually, you are correct, mm. but not completely. I can't oh. believe we didn't turn this into a drinking game. Ugh. That is the fib, but Chinese Santa does play saxophone, hmm. and rather than elves, he does have women with him, but they are his sisters. Interesting fib. Hmm. So you know I am the queen of inappropriate, so get ready. Oh, I know this. Mm -hmm. I'm also going to start with the Chinese traditions. So I want to quiz your knowledge on gifts to avoid giving anyone in your life who might be of the Chinese culture. 
And like I said, I weaved our characters into the game. While doing this research, I also realized that I had likely totally offended one of my prior students I was training when I was teaching him to be an investigator. Was he Chinese? Yes. Oh my gosh. I am so mortified. But enough on that. Here are my two facts and a fib. Number one, it was not a nice gift for Matt to give his sister an expensive set of Henkel's knives for Christmas. Two, Gus's gift to Kevin, a warm green hat, was such a sentimental gift that it would be worn with pride. And number three, Kevin's giving Matt a nice bottle of cognac would have been so appropriate for this story. I like how you just skipped over what you did to offend your investigator. <laughs> but those those all seem like perfectly acceptable gifts. Hmm. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to go with the knives because I'm afraid Matt's sister might put one in his back, which is not a good use for a gift. Nope. You are incorrect. The first one is true, as you are not to give sharp objects such as knives and scissors as gifts. You are telling the receiver of that gift that you are wanting to sever ties with him or her. Matt would never want to do that to his sister, right? Maybe. (laughs) And you are good. Totally missed the word not, which means I kind of technically got it correct because I said it wasn't a good gift. But technically, you got it wrong because it's the power of the details, my friend. You are so right. So what is the fib? The last one is also true, as it's very nice to give an item of luxury, such as an expensive bottle of cognac or whiskey. I'll take an item of luxury. Or even Prosecco Mm. to someone romantic or someone close to the family. And Gus is almost family, according to Matt. Number two was the fib. What? Now listen to this. If Gus gave Kevin a green hat, Gus is telling Kevin that his wife, who is Matt's sister, is cheating on Kevin. Wow. Okay. A green hat is bad news then. Does the military know this? I mean, green hats are handed out like candy during basic training issue. Gives new meaning to some of those cadences. Never knew that. Now remember, Wendy, I was talking Chinese culture, not American. Oh, yes. It's the details you said, right? Mm Mm-hmm. You are correct. Now for some American Christmas traditions. Ready? Mm Mm-hmm. One, during World War I, American and British intelligence agencies worked with a playing card company to make a very special deck of cards that were given out at Christmas. They helped allied prisoners of war escape. Individual cards peeled apart when they got wet, to reveal maps of escape routes. Two, mistletoe might be about getting a romantic kiss from your sweetheart, but the Germanic word for mistletoe literally means dung on a twig. (laughs) Three, hold your applause. Three, Jingle Bells was originally a Thanksgiving song. It was titled One Horse Open Sleigh and written for a church's Thanksgiving concert. Interesting. I see I'm slowly bringing you over to the dark side. Look at you coming out with a poop joke. Well, we become what we are around. Your force must be stronger than mine. (laughs) You're literally trying to stump me at my own game. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say number two, dung on a twig, is a fib. I cannot imagine that the romantic mistletoe would ever be considered in such a vile way. Well, I'm sorry. But number two is true. Mmm, you ruined that for me. I'll never kiss Josh under a dung on a twig again. I'll just kiss Rufino instead. Getting tickets to that. (laughs) So animals eat the mistletoe berries, digest the seeds, and the droppings grow into new plants. Mm. The fib is the first one. It was World War II. Details. Details, Amy. Mm. The playing cards would help POWs escape German concentration camps. You know, I'm surprised I didn't know that, as I love World War I and II history. I am too. Okay, so my turn. American Christmas tradition. Okay. Number one, in Great Falls, Montana, you know, in my hometown, it's tradition to have a massive yearly Christmas tree in the center of town made out of tumbleweeds encased in chicken wire coated in a flame of retardant substance, and illuminated with colorful lights. It would be. Number two, 
Another Christmas tradition would be to drive a couple hours southwest to Bozeman, Montana to the annual Bozeman Ice Festival to climb Hyalite Canyon, a frozen waterfall of luxurious ice. And number three, moving to your part over yonder to Medora, North Dakota. I do know that. Where you can celebrate an old-fashioned cowboy Christmas drinking hot whiskey nog and partying with your friends all the while wearing a ten-gallon hat rather than a typical Santa cap. Yeehaw! All those things sound equally ridiculous, which means absolutely nothing coming from you. <laughs> right, because the power is in the details. Yes, which is why I'm going with number three. I've been to Medora, and the ten-gallon hat is not typical there ever. That's more of a Texas thing. Well, my friend, then you've not been home in a while, as there is a website that speaks of said celebration in those 10-gallon hats. I'm, I'm speechless. I've got nothing. What's the fib? Okay, so the Bozeman and Medora traditions are true, but you're going to have to leave Great Falls, Montana and head south to Chandler, Arizona to see your tumbleweed Christmas tree. They've been erecting this tree since the 50s, and it was said that it takes about 1,000 bushes to make the tree. In your parts and mine, the tumbleweeds are only seen blowing across the highway between prairies or, you know, in a toss salad. I did wonder about that one, but it sounded so specific and ridiculous I figured it must be true. I do love when we get to learn new stuff. Which brings us to our random. Now this was not our idea. We got it from the Escape Pod 459 episode where John Chu read his story. And we found it very intriguing. And yes, the story of none other but the Italian stallion Pinocchio. What? And oh, so appropriate. I have no idea where this is going and I'm scared. Well, I have a song. Uh, Pinocchio, 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 <laughs> you'll find us if you have to go to Tokyo. Come out, come out, wherever you are. Pinocchio, Pinocchio, Pinocchio. Have you ever heard that before? No, I have no words for that. Do you mind if I move on to what? <laughs> the look on your face is flippin' priceless. I, 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 I don't really know how to approach that, so I'm just going to go. Uh, can I continue with my discussion? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so, so Alistair Stewart, the host of the episode, talked briefly about Pinocchio being an original coming out story. Song. <laughs> I'm actually thinking of your song. I can't really stop thinking about it. But it was just such a new way to think about the story. But with this and, and your song, it, it made complete sense. Now, Mr. Stewart, <laughs> I can't stop thinking about my song either, but you know, I know Mr. But you Stewart sounded, you sounded very good. talked about Pinocchio wanting to be a real boy and Geppetto wanting to change him, right? not accepting that Pinocchio is a puppet. It was a very interesting parallel. I thought of Matt's sister. She struggled the most to accept Matt, though she spun the narrative to it being her parents who would have had the problem. She did. But Matt struggled as well, like Pinocchio. He mm -hmm. wanted to be accepted and loved, but didn't know how to make it happen until it just did. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't solve all the problems in real life. Right. Pinocchio, though, is a fairy tale, right? Mm -hmm. So it just looks like Pinocchio being made into the real boy solves everything. I think we need a sequel to Pinocchio. Maybe you could write that up, Wendy, and I could sing the song? Um... <laughs> I would say that's a great idea. I, I'm worried about the song and I love sequels, but for us, we're not going to go into a sequel here, okay? Not enough Prosecco? No, no, definitely not. But I do think we have just enough time to find out what you did that was so offensive to your investigator. Dying oh, to know. Oh, come on. We, we were going to cut this one short because okay, well, it is a short, but so long story short. 
just figured this out after doing all this research on gift giving in the Chinese culture. Research is important. Mm -hmm. So I was training an older gentleman to be an investigator. I had to do the training in his home. You know, it was a requirement okay. for our job. Okay. His wife was not overly comfortable with me being in this basement office all day alone, you know, with him or driving around in the same car. So I tried to smooth the situation over. She was just a lovely lady. Couldn't figure out though, you know, why it was such a big deal. Okay, but it makes sense, her discomfort. Not that you are some husband stealer. So what'd you do? So the second week in, still feeling a little uncomfortable, I went to Wagman's. I love Wagman's grocery mm, store. Yes. I purchased four cinnamon rolls that Yum. were wrapped in this beautiful white paper box and a small bouquet of really pretty flowers. In the Chinese culture, I found out in my research that you do not give anything in fours. Really? It's a bad omen. And you do not give flowers as a gift as this is wishing someone on the way to his or her funeral. Truth. What? I, I would have taken some cinnamon rolls. I'm oh. not going to lie, but... But that's not all either. What? There's more? I didn't offer her these gifts with two hands. Not appropriate. <clears throat> I remember this specifically as I had the box of cinnamon rolls in a bag on my arm. I was trying to balance them. Mm -hmm. And I handed her the flowers with one hand. And she said no to me. And I insisted. Of course you did. <laughs> so there was kind of a weird look between her and her husband. Oh, I was just like, oh, I'm such a bad investigator. And then I also found out that I'm a bad um, culture catcher too. Wow. You knocked the bad vibes right out of the park. It was not a home run hit kind of day. I truly though, at the time had no idea. No wonder I never heard from him again after <laughs> I gave him his final you know, check ride, his final exam. Come to think of it, he's actually the only investigator I don't keep in contact with. It's probably on purpose. Mm. But that's awful. You didn't know you were trying to help the situation not make it so much more worse. Wow. Yeah. I'm just so sorry to have committed so many bad cultural offenses all in like five minutes. Well, I guess you can take your new knowledge forward. I certainly can. And on that note, we'd love to know what you guys thought about Amy's story or anything else discussed today. And to have you join us for our season finale, mm. The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab. Such an amazing story. Can't wait. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you again for joining us for this episode of Prosecco and Prose. To view the complete show notes for today's episode, visit www.prosecco.com. Nprose.com. Before you go, please subscribe to Prosecco and Pros so you can be alerted of new episodes when they are dropped. You can subscribe right now in the app you're listening to. We've got a quick favor to ask. If you're enjoying the podcast so far, let us know. It takes just a minute for you to leave us a review, which helps us and Apple know that listeners like you enjoy our show. And that helps us expand our reach. It really does make a difference. I'm Amy. And I'm Wendy. Signing off as our bottle of bubbly is now empty. See you for our next episode. And in the meantime, pop, pop a cork, cork and, and read. read.